Hello and welcome to Factually. I'm Adam Conover. Thank you so much for joining me once again as I talk to an incredible expert about all the amazing things that they know that I don't know and that you might not know. If you're listening on YouTube, go check us out in your favorite podcast player. If you're listening on your favorite podcast player, hey, check us out on YouTube if you want to see this episode in video form. Now, on this show, we're going to be talking about something that's going to sound like a conspiracy theory. It's going to sound like I've been hanging out on the wrong Reddit forums, but this is one of those conspiracies that's actually just true. American democracy is under attack right now. Literally, powerful people in our society are trying to make our country less democratic so they can call the shots. Which is nuts because, you know, in school we were all taught that, you know, democracy is a fundamental American value. But the truth is, America hasn't been truly democratic for almost its entire history. In the 1960s, the system of social and political exclusion known as Jim Crow, America's very own apartheid system, severely curtailed black voting rights in the South. Black people were a full 20% of the Southern population, but the white population called all of the shots. And it took massive and heroic resistance of the civil rights era to bring Jim Crow to an end. This required legal victories and iconic legislation, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, which together for the first time turned America into something like a democracy for all of its citizens just, you know, 60 short years ago. And I grew up, as many of you did, having been taught this story of grand American triumph, the lunch counter sit-ins, MLK, the March on Washington. We expanded democracy for everyone. And because of this story's power, I couldn't imagine an end to this sort of moral and political progress. Well, guess what? In recent decades, there has been a concerted, billionaire-funded campaign to roll the progress of American democracy back. This anti-democracy campaign has funded activism, litigation, and legislation designed to make voting more difficult for people of color, the young, and the poor, and probably you. It seeded panic over the non-existent problem of voter fraud and used the courts to take a hatchet to the centerpiece of the Voting Rights Act. And this effort has fostered an environment of increased distrust in elections for those on the right, which made it easier for Donald Trump to try and overturn his defeat in 2020. So how far backwards have we slipped? How much of American democracy have we lost? What impact has this movement had and how can we fight back? Well, to answer that question, we have an amazing guest for you today. But before we get to that, I want to remind you that if you want to support this show and help keep it free for everyone listening, I hope that you will support us on Patreon. Just head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Just five bucks a month gets you every episode of this podcast ad free, plus a lot of extra goodies. And if you like stand up comedy, please come see me on tour this year. If you're in Buffalo, Baltimore, St. Louis or Providence, Rhode Island or elsewhere across the country, head to adamconover.net for tickets and tour dates. I'd love to see you there. I do a meet and greet after every show and I love meeting all you folks who listen to the podcast. Now, let's get to today's guest because we have a banger today. His name is Rick Hassan and he is a professor of law at UCLA and one of the foremost experts on election law in America. He's the author of many books, including Election Meltdown, and his newest book is called A Real Right to Vote. Please welcome Rick Hassan. Rick, thank you so much for being on the show. It's great to be with you. So look, we have this legend we're told about America as, kill as children, that America is the most democratic country on earth and that, that it's gotten more democratic over time. Uh, as someone who studies this, what is your view on that? Is, is America more or less democratic than it was, say, just a, a couple decades ago. You know, things go up and down. Mm. Uh, they go in cycles. Uh, certainly, more people are eligible to vote today, formally, than ever in American history, right? It took the 15th Amendment and then the Voting Rights Act to enfranchise black Americans. It took the 19th Amendment to enfranchise women. Mm -hmm. um, so in that way, things, things are much better. Uh, there are no poll taxes. Uh, property tests for voting, those things are gone. Uh, but it's not a kind of linear progression. Mm -hmm. Right after the Civil War, blacks were voting in large numbers and, and sending their preferred candidates to Congress and electing them to bodies. And then, uh, you know, we, you had uh, in the South a retrenchment. And it's, yeah. it, it was the Jim decades, Crow right? It was decades until. You know, had to send federal troops to yeah. register voters. So, well, and in fact, the, a lot of the country for a hundred years after that point, we had black elected officials in this country, and then the Jim Crow era began. And then for a hundred years, America was a functional apartheid state where you had a 
in many places, a black majority and a white minority who were the only ones who were functionally able to vote. And that persisted until the 60s, unless I'm wrong. I don't mean to tell you, the, the election expert, this. but So, so it, it differed in different parts of the country, yeah. but the, things were worst in the South. But yeah. th there were some places in the North where they weren't so great either. Very much so. Um, and, um, you know, today it's much easier to vote than it was before 1960. Mm -hmm. But maybe in some places it was easier 20 years ago to register and vote than it is now. It really, really depends on what you're talking about. Um, in research that I uh, was doing for my upcoming book, A Real Right to Vote, uh, I looked at how Native American voters are treated in the Dakotas and in other places. And in some ways, that looks like the Jim Crow South. Yeah. Uh, you know, that um, a number of these um, eligible voters live on reservations, which don't have residential street addresses. Mm. And when the state passes a law that says you need a residential street address if you want to vote, right. that can functionally serve to disenfranchise people. Many, many, many people in America don't have residential street addresses if they live in a vehicle, if they uh, are unhoused in some other way, or if they have a strange address. I mean, I just live on, a, my address is, for some reason, doesn't come up in a lot of databases. And I'm constantly in a situation where someone's like, I can't find your address in the system, so we can't help you. I'm like, no, it's a real, ad like this happens to people, right? And when those barriers are in place, it actually stops people from voting. Yeah, so I think we need to step back for a minute and, sure, and talk about how the United States, if, if not unique, is extremely rare among modern democracies in that it's really decentralized, right? Mm. So we conduct something like 10,000 different elections when we Hold a presidential election. Meaning because the, the elections are run by a state or local body. They're generally run by the county level. Yeah. It's a mix of rules from the federal, from the U.S. Constitution and from federal statutes and state law and then on the county level. Um, so it's decentralized. We also run elections with, in some places, partisan election officials. You know, mm -hmm. someone runs for secretary of state in California here as a Democrat or Republican. Right. That's weird. Yeah. Um, and there's the state uh, or the, the government, I should say, doesn't have a responsibility to automatically register all voters. Mm -hmm. Even here in California, where we have so-called automatic voter registration, that's just if you go to the DMV. It's not as though you have state workers going from place to place, making right. sure everybody's registered. Uh, lots of places also, lots of other countries, they have a national voter ID. You know, voter ID is radioactive here because the way that states have put those requirements in place mm -hmm. are sometimes discriminatory. So in, in a place like Texas, a concealed weapons permit can count as a valid ID, but a student ID cannot, right? Wow. But in a country where everyone who's eligible to vote is registered as soon as they're eligible and they have that voter registration number for their whole lives, it's just, it, it's more seamless. Yeah. There's not, uh, you know, there's not, they're not what I've called the voting wars, the fights over these election rules, and if someone is otherwise eligible to vote, they don't have to jump through hurdles to be able to do yeah. it. Well, so when we talk about these hurdles, you mentioned you know, the Jim Crow era, the poll taxes, right, or the tests that people, people would be forced to take literacy tests to see if they could vote in some places. And part of, again, what I was taught in school was that was racist, it was discriminatory, it was anti-democratic, and we got rid of it. And hey, everything's fixed, right? We solved all the problems of American racism with the civil rights move uh, in the civil rights movement in the sixties. Um, now there are states putting in new restrictions of varying types b based on the state, um, whether it's an ID rule or you know you see things happening like say in Florida where uh, the voters voted to give uh, uh, former felons the right to vote, uh, and then the state ends up stripping a lot of that right away and making them like pay these fees. Um, they have to pay like the court fees or whatever before they can vote. When you look at those restrictions. Do they resemble those Jim Crow restrictions to you? Do you look at that and say, hold on a second, a barrier to voting is a barrier to voting? So I think it depends on what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So some things like during COVID, we saw a big expansion of voting by mail, which made a lot of sense because yeah. people weren't comfortable going in person and also because it was hard to get workers to work at polls in person. And so now there's been a pulling back in some places on vote by mail. Uh, I don't think that pullback is justified by, say, a concern about fraud the way that Trump yeah. and others. But, you know, that that's kind of a policy choice that we leave to states. But then there are other things that do look like Jim Crow. Um, I like uh, your example about the felon disenfranchisement laws. Um, 
it's pretty interesting that both Democrats and Republican voters in Florida overwhelmingly supported the reenfranchisement of felons yeah. after they completed their sentences. And then uh, the legislature came in and said, wait a minute, you've got to pay your fines and fees. That's what it means to have completed your sentence. The problem in Florida is that there is no central repository of uh, uh, information about whether you've paid your fines and fees. So if you're a former felon, and you're deciding, should I register to vote? And you don't know 20 years ago when you were charged in another Florida county, mm -hmm. if you owe $100, mm -hmm. are you going to bother to register when you could be committing another felony? You know, and, and how do you even how do you even find that information? Like if you owe the money, right? And if you're worried that hold on a second, because in some of these places they actually make it a, a crime to try to vote when you have you know when you're not able to. There are cases in which people have been charged sure. for attempting to vote just because they were confused. Um, that's going to cause all those people to just stay miles away from the voting system, which, again, that sounds not dissimilar to Jim Crow, to have there be barriers where, hey, if you if you uh, want to vote, you need to pay some money. You might go to jail. You might there might be retribution against you if you try to vote. That results in entire swaths of people saying the election system isn't for me. Right. And I think that the purpose is. We know that in Florida, um, black uh, felons, felons in Florida are more likely to be black, mm -hmm. and black voters are more likely to vote for de Democrats. Mm -hmm. And so the thinking is, I think, this is either discrimination against blacks or discrimination against Democrats. Yeah. Um, whether it has that effect is a different question, but what the intent is, I think the intent is to give an advantage in a state where you're worried about close elections. Uh, last year, uh, Governor DeSantis held a press conference where he said, you know, we're going after the scoff laws. And well, who did he go after? In that law that Florida passed, that uh, voter initiative that restored felon rights and said you didn't have to go through this process where the governor and a board has to restore your rights, there was an exception for people who committed sex-related crimes and who committed murder. And so there were some people who committed sex-related crimes many years ago, some of them, and they were sent a voter registration form by the local um, board in some cases. They went to register to vote and then they were arrested like in, in raids. Yeah. Me meanwhile, we know of at least four voters in the villages. The villages is this retirement community, very big community in Florida. Yeah. Very, uh, a lot of Trump supporters there. Very affluent folks. That's expensive. We, we know at least four voters who were um, convicted of uh, or pled, pled guilty to double voting, voting in both Florida and another state. Mm. A lot of snowbirds in Florida, uh -huh. right? So you might like live in New York during the summer, but in the winter you yeah. go down to Florida, you might be registered in both places. Some people uh, voted in both places. Yeah. DeSantis has not gone after them. Yeah. They're uh, white but Republican also, Trump supporters. But also if some, like either of those examples is is 99% chance that someone making an honest mistake, you know, like, like even, even a, like, even there's some number of snowbirds, right. Doing this, this is not my biggest concern about the election system that somebody is like flying back and forth, et cetera. There's going to be uh, like, we don't need to be arresting people for, for uh, making voting errors. Do we? Well, isn't, so isn't yeah, so suppression itself? I agree that we do not need to arrest people for making voting errors. And so, for example, if someone honestly thought they were eligible to vote, yeah. Because Florida announces felons are reenfranchised. And they got a form in the mail. Right. I, I think that's that is something that should not be prosecuted. But if you know that it's illegal to vote in two states and you vote by mail in one state and you vote in person in the other, that's a crime. Now, that doesn't mean you go to jail for 20 years, but it's a crime and it should be prosecuted. I think we do have to take real election crimes seriously. I'm worried mm -hmm. about, for example, the attempt to overturn the 2020 election. Sure. So there are election crimes we need to take seriously, but Honest mistakes. Another thing that Florida uh, is doing, uh, they passed a law that said that if you are, uh, they're trying to make it harder to register voters to vote, right? Again, these hurdles that yeah. almost no other country, uh, Democratic country, puts in front of voters. Uh, they made it a crime if you're a non citizen to go out and handle a voter registration form or to give certain information to voters. So if you're a green card holder, you're allowed to engage in certain political activity, you're allowed to make contributions to candidates. You're allowed in, I think, every other state to go out and um, help register voters, even if you can't vote yourself. Mm -hmm. Florida has made that a crime. 
Mm. And a federal district court judge uh, just last week said that's unconstitutional. Yeah. Now, he's a pretty liberal, Democratic appointed judge. He's been overturned before by the 11th Circuit uh, when, uh, you know, he found other Florida laws were yeah. discriminatory. So I don't know if it's going to stick. But again, you know, what what crime are we really, uh, the, the crime of voting? Is that what yeah. is so uh, terrible? And, and the very strange thing is that, you know, the these laws that DeSantis's group is putting in place to restrict uh, voting by former felons, this is... Uh, uh, this was originally an initiative that the voters voted through in massive numbers, Republicans and Democrats and independents all voted and said, yes, we want to re-enfranchise our fellow citizens after they have served their time. This is part of re-entering society. This is what it means to be an American. You get a vote no matter what, you know, no matter who you are. And they, they voted for that in, in enormous numbers. And then the legislature and the governor go and say, no, that's too much democracy for us. No, no, we think that's those are scoff laws. We want to make sure that da, 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 da. I, I mean, it seems so un-American to me to do that. And it's not just because it's it's, you know, DeSantis and, and those folks in Florida. That's un-American to try to uh, restrict voting like that anywhere. What, I mean, where did this what happened to this to voting as a fundamental American value? Well, first of all, uh, the Constitution does not protect anyone's right to vote. That, that's what my upcoming book is about, yeah. A Real Right to Vote. The Constitution, what does the Constitution say about voting? Uh, first thing it says is, uh, who can vote for a member of Congress? Whoever the state says can vote for the state representatives, they get to vote for Congress. It doesn't say any particular person gets the right to vote. Wow. Then what's the next thing it says? It says, no discrimination in voting on the basis of race. So if you're going to hold an election, you can't say whites only. Next thing it says is, uh, 19th Amendment. Can't discriminate on the basis of gender. There's no affirmative right to vote. As the, you know, you look at the yeah. Canadian Constitution, the German Constitution. You look at other advanced democracies that we would compare ourselves to, and their constitutions contain a right to vote. And I bet if you asked Americans, if even if you asked like you know civics kids in you know tenth grade or whatever, and said list the rights that are to you in the Constitution, they would say oh free speech, freedom of religion, and I bet more than half of them would say the right to vote because it's it's inculcated us in us as a right that we have, and yet it is not. Is right. Th that is bizarre. So, but in the even in the Fourteenth Amendment, um, which uh, was the amendment passed just before the Fifteenth Amendment that said no discrimination on the basis of, of voting on uh, no discrimination um, in voting on the basis of race. In the Fourteenth Amendment, it included a penalty for certain states that didn't give representation uh, to African Americans, but it had an exception for felons. Mm. Uh, so there's been a longstanding tradition in this country of felon disenfranchisement. Yeah. The way that that's changed has been state by state. Yeah. And many states have taken the view when you are incarcerated, you lose your right to vote. Like you lose your freedom of movement, right? Mm -hmm. Ordinarily we have freedom to go where we want when you're in prison, you don't because you've committed a crime. But once you've completed your term in, uh, uh, in the prison, you should be have your rights restored. Yeah. And so that's kind of a success story, Florida to one side, is that many places, Democratic and Republican, have moved, I think, and this is part of criminal justice reform, have moved towards the reenfranchisement of felons. But that's not in the Constitution. Lawsuits that have tried to get either the Constitution or the Voting Rights Act interpreted to require the reenfranchisement of felons have failed. So it's going to be a political movement yeah. that's going to- And it has cost. to be state by state. Or or you can have a U.S. constitutional amendment, but that that's hard to do. I, I think we might have a little trouble getting an amendment through anytime soon. Yes, but I actually argue uh, in okay. this book that we need to think of the 19th, I spent a lot of time studying the 19th Amendment. That's the one that uh, re-enfranchised, that enfranchised women um, in past in, in the 1920s. The movement started in the 1780s. Hmm. And it really took off at the time after the Civil War. There was a woman um, who named Virginia Minor. Uh, she was a Missouri uh, resident, white woman citizen. She went to the Supreme Court. She said, hey, uh, we just passed the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment says that I'm entitled to all the privileges or immunities of citizenship. I should be allowed to vote. They're not letting me vote because I'm a woman. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, yes, you're a citizen. 
Um, you have the privilege of German citizenship, but voting's not one of those. That's really up to the state. Wow. So, uh, so we have this long history that, that, of that leaving was, that, that was question. in 1780? That was in 1877. In 1877. 1780 is when the movement towards women's enfranchisement started. This is 100 years into the movement, right. they were saying that. So, Holy shit. So in, after, so in the 1870s and forward, women and men started organizing state by state, and they started changing state constitutions to yeah. give women the right to vote. So by the time you got to the 1920, when when Congress considers this, many of the members of Congress had come from states that had re had enfranchised women. And mm -hmm. so the lesson to be learned from all of this is that movements to expand voting rights can be organized around constitutional amendments, but it takes time. So yeah. it might not be my generation or your generation. It might take two more generations, yeah. but that movement itself pays dividends. And it does work, as we saw in Florida, that when you put it to the voters, and there's been a lot of uh, progress in states using the sort of state ballot systems because voters generally love democracy. If you say, hey, should there be more democracy? Most Americans raise their hands and say yes, because they have that American value. But when, when it comes to the reason that our election system is so local, that, it, that it's not enshrined in our constitution in a way that guarantees it to people, it's state by state. So much power is devolved upon the state, and that means you have people in different states voting for the same national offices, but using radically different rules that are run by different people over, all over the country. Why do we have a system like this, and is there any argument for it? We've talked about a lot of the downsides already, but is there any benefit to having a locally run election system? Well, the reason for it, I think, is the age of our Constitution. Mm. You know, lots of democracies have newer constitutions. You know, France, Germany gets a new one after World War II, same with Japan, right? Um, we've always done it that way. Mm -hmm. And then it's hard to change it because there's a vested interest in. Yeah. So you may remember after 2000, the disputed election, Bush versus Gore came down to Florida's votes and the US Supreme Court ends up deciding to stop a recount and Bush narrowly wins the election, mm -hmm. Congress passed a law two years later called the Help America Vote Act. And one of the things it did was it created an agency called the United States Election Assistance Commission. I'm sure you've never heard of it. No. Well, very few people have. Uh, it has very little power. All it does is it, it, it was able to give out money to fix the voting machines. Remember the hanging chads of bad voting machines? <laughs> oh, the voting machine's broken. Get, get 50 bucks from the election commission in here. Hire a guy. So they all they do is you know put out data and it suggests best practices they have no power of anything and both democratic and republican secretaries of state the chief election officer of state have called for the agency to be disbanded because mm. it's too powerful um wait they say because it's too powerful they say even well, even with its toothless yeah. role it's too powerful yeah. because you know it's a turf war thing so what are the arguments for local control well one argument is accountability you know like if um you know, a Democrat or Republican runs in California for Secretary of State. We now expect, because of the different ideologies, a Democrat might run the election differently than a Republican. Sure. So, so that might be a reason. And you know, if you have it on the local level, if you don't like how um, the local registrar of voters is running things, you can go complain to your county board as opposed to trying to complain to some federal agency far away. So that's that's the argument for local control. A another argument that. Uh, has been made in favor of local control, you have to look at 2020. Imagine if Trump were uh, having some control over how a federal election was run. He could have tried to subvert the election in a national way. Here, he had to go to the Secretary of State of Georgia. He had to go to the legislators in Wisconsin. Yeah, but, but you know, he lost a couple of states. If it had been down to one state and it had, you know, there's the... Uh, one of the final episodes of Succession had a scenario like this, right? Where if it comes down to one state and then something goes very wrong at just that one state level, you know, maybe uh, the election goes a little bit differently. It does come down to just Georgia and the people in Georgia are a little bit friendlier. And that, that's essentially what happened in Florida, right? That that it was uh, the decision of a of a Florida court body, right? That the Supreme Court declined to overturn. So it was a Florida decision that affected the national election, right? So we, yes, but not, not quite. So okay. in Florida, you had a state Supreme Court 
that was dominated by Democrats that ruled in favor of Al Gore, the right. Democrats, to keep counting the votes. Yes. And then you had the conservatives on the Supreme Court reverse the, that decision. Yes. So I like to say that everybody agrees the problem in Bush versus Gore was an out of control court. It's just that Democrats think that's the U.S. <laughs> Supreme Court and Republicans think it's the Florida Supreme Court. Uh, but again, it's a kind of a crazy system. Yeah. Uh, you know, so uh, that episode of Succession gave me hives. I wrote a piece in Slate that it just <laughs> like, Oh, how so? I, wait, I want to hear a little so, bit more. So usually when I watch TV and they've yeah. got an election scenario or loss scenario, I'm rolling my eyes like, this is so unrealistic. Uh, but they had come up with a very plausible nightmare scenario. And yes. it turns out a couple of my friends uh, who are election lawyers were consultants for uh, uh, the uh, succession. There was a fire at a voting center, right? Where a bunch of paper ballots were stored. Was that's the, was they, the they, they, Yeah, these were ballots, mail-in ballots. Yeah. And then, you know, what do you do? Do you rerun the election? Uh, you know, and there's riots in the streets and yeah. uh, um, uh, and it's outcome determinative. You know, the the, yeah. the Republican wins if these ballots are, are not counted. Yeah. Um, and back in, in Florida in 2000, you may remember the butterfly ballot. I don't know of if you course. remember this. Look, no, he, here's the thing. For me, the 2000 election was the first election that I, uh, you know, participated in in any way, even just emotionally. And so, uh, you know, uh, the one before that, uh, you know, Clinton's uh, last election, whatever, I was a little bit too young. But then, you know, I was, oh, yeah, we got to care about this, blah, 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 blah. And, and so for my first experience of an election to be this election with all this controversy, and, uh, you know, judicially decided outcomes, it was, uh, I think it really shaped my view of democracy as I think it did for a lot of my generation. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a cathartic moment for the United States and a wake up call about how poorly run our election system was. Our election systems that are actually run much better today in terms of the machinery. Oh, okay. I was going to say a wake up call and we went right back to sleep because I didn't think we improved anything. Well, maybe I'm wrong. so, you know, by 2004, just mm -hmm. the next election, we think uh, that a million fewer people had their uh, votes not counted because of poor technology. Mm. So lots of people voted in Florida and their votes didn't count because when they tried to punch out the little piece of paper, the, the hanging chad, you know, got stuck. Yeah. So the, the punch card voting papers, I've, I've got a machine and I have my students come and look at it in my office, a, a Florida 2000 voting machine. That was state of the art for 1945 and they were running the elections in 2000 using that. Yeah. So in... Things were especially bad in the um, uh, Palm Beach County area. There were, I think, 13 candidates running for president. The local election administrator, who was a Democrat, said, you know, I've got a lot of elderly voters. It's going to be really hard for them to read all these names mm -hmm. on the ballot. So I'm going to make the font larger, and I'm going to print it on both sides of the page. This yeah. is why it's the butterfly ballot, because yeah. it's symmetrical. And so... You had names on this side and names on this side and arrows pointing to the middle, but it didn't actually line up. The yeah. holes didn't line. So you had the so-called Jews for Buchanan vote. You had all of these elderly Jewish people. Yeah. Uh, voting for an anti-Semite. Voting, voting, voting for, well, at least an anti-Israel guy, yeah. Pat Buchanan. And some of them voted twice because it looked like one line was next to Gore and one was next to Lieberman and was his running mate. Yeah. So my former boss, Urban Chemerinsky, noted constitutional law scholar, went to the Florida courts and said, hey, we need a do-over in Palm mm -hmm. Beach County. All these voters messed up. And they said, no, nah, you can't do a do-over. Yeah. And so back to succession. This, by the way, is that one of the biggest graphic design fuck-ups in history. A graphic design error. I mean, look, we have some wonderful graphic design, you know, the people I work with, but if they fuck up the, the typeface, it doesn't ruin an election. You That's know? right. Yes. And that, that has improved too. There are people who study <laughs> okay, this stuff. Good. So not everything has gotten worse since 2000. I yeah. mean, there are a lot of lessons that were bad lessons that were learned from 2000, like, oh, if I'm a partisan election official, I can change the rules to help my side win. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's not a good lesson. Um, you know, or litigation is the way to go. So, you know, we had a couple of dozen lawsuits in Florida. My, I've been studying the amount of litigation. It's tripled in the period after 2000 compared to the period before. So people are suing all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, th there's only so much a court will do to remedy the situation. And in the succession uh, scenario, it's not clear. And Wisconsin law is not clear and federal law is not clear. What do you do when, uh, you know, thousands of ballots have been destroyed in an election? Yeah. There are only a handful of states that have 
rules in their election codes for how to deal with emergencies. So imagine earthquake the day of an election in California. Yeah. Florida actually has some rules because they have hurricanes all the time, but there are lots of states that don't have it. And so again, back to the decentralization, it's one of the um, weaknesses. Yeah. Because, you know, I've, I, I wrote- we don't have uniform rules or even any rules in many places. Yeah. I wrote in my book, Election Meltdown, uh, which- uh, came out in 2020 on the day of the Iowa caucuses when they melted down. You know, remember they used an app and the app didn't work. That that elections are only as strong as their weakest link. Yeah. Like 95% of people could be doing a fantastic job. But if it's a really close election, yeah. the attention turns to that 5%. And then, of course, people see something that's messed up and they think, oh, it's and not incompetence. It was, you know, intentional. Yeah. Because well, you don't trust anybody. And there's so many... You, what you're making me realize is there's so many scenarios where we don't have any rules on the books, like a voting center burning down or like a butterfly ballot, where what do you do when there's no rules on the books? You have to go to the courts. What happens when you go to the courts? You've got judges who are appointed by Re Republicans and Democrats or who have a leaning one way or the other because they're human beings on earth. And then you've got lawyers making the cases to them and you've got other courts overturning them and you're now in the political process, right? And there's no way to look at that process and say, it's a myth that the courts are not political. Of course they all are. Um, and, and so there's, there's no getting out of that situation in a way that feels unbiased to us because we haven't put together the rules of the road. This is fascinating. We have to take a really quick break. I have a really big picture question for you when we come back, but we'll, we'll be right back with more Rick Hassan. You know, everybody, this summer has been a really active time for me. I've been making this show, I've been hitting the picket line, and I've been trying to work out more. Between all of this, I'm trying to be extra careful not to let everyday hydration slip between the cracks. That is why I have been all about Liquid IV. You know, they say that using just one stick of Liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates you two times faster and more efficiently than water alone. And you know, I'm not also not a big fan of sugary drinks where I can spike my blood sugar, so their hydration multiplier sugar-free is a great option with fantastic taste and no artificial sweeteners. I've also been really enjoying their three new flavors, grape, lemon, lime, and my favorite, white peach. All non-GMO and free from gluten, dairy, and soy, real people, real flavor, real hydrating, now sugar-free. Grab your Liquid IV Hydration Multiplier sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco or get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code FACTUALLY at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you use promo code FACTUALLY at liquidiv.com. Okay, we're back with Rick Hassan. We're talking about the state of democracy in America and all of the, the power that local officials have to control elections, to restrict who votes. And it strikes me that there's sort of a fundamental problem here because in my own political work, both in local politics here in Los Angeles and in the union politics I'm involved in, I've come to realize that if you're running for office, the most important thing is how many people you can get to show up to vote, right? Like literally how many bodies are gonna go to the school or you know the, the community center or how many people are gonna go to the mailbox and actually put the thing in. And so it really matters to you uh, whether it's raining and how excited people are. You know, I'll give you a good example of this. A couple of years ago, the LA City Council decided they used to have their city council elections um, you know, uh, way off of the national calendar. It would be like an off year on a weird Wednesday in the middle of April or something, right? And they decided turnout's too low. We're going to sync it up with the national election. So now city council elections are synced up with like literally the election for president every four years. And so um, I knew a, a candidate who was running for city council and she was like, look, about 10 times as many people are going to vote in this election as voted last time. I have a chance to unseat the last the, the, the previous guy because nobody even knows his name because he was running at a very low turnout election. And so. And and it worked and she won because the the electorate was entirely different on this day. So um, I, I understand every politician must be attuned to the, the demographics of the electorate and who's going to show up. That's going to control who wins. That gives them an incentive to try to control who shows up to the polls. So if you're Ron DeSantis and the voters pass this resolution saying uh, this, this amendment saying, guess what? Former felons get to vote. You're like. It just changed the entire electorate. And that was the electorate that voted me in, so I got to change it back. Um, seems like a really perverse incentive. What the fuck do we do about it? <laughs> like, how, how, that's, Is that a problem that's solvable? Well, there's a few things to say. First, um, it's not clear that these laws have 
as much of a partisan effect as people think. Okay. There's a new study. It was just written up in the New York Times, in a column by Tom Edsel. People want to look it up. That uh, this is a paper by a professor at Stanford uh, named Justin Grimmer, Grimmer and a professor at Tufts named Aton Hirsch. And they found that, you know, like let's say felons break down 60 40 Democratic. And mm. let's say that if you reenfranchise them, uh, 10% of them are going to vote because mm. turnout among poor people tends to be lower. Turnout among f- former felons who reenfranchise. So 10%, but it's splitting 60 40. So, like the partisan effects don't necessarily matter. Democrats mm-hmm. and Republicans both act as though the effects of these laws are massive. Yeah. And in fact, they're not. Now, that's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, like, you know, then why are we fighting over this? Yeah. And I think the answer is because it's the dignity of each voter. Like, if you're mm-hmm. disenfranchising women or you're disenfranchising Native Americans, it doesn't matter if it affects the election outcome. It's yeah. Each of us is entitled to equal dignity. There's a deeper value that some folks, myself included, believe that like every human who's in this country deserves a say in it and is a valid person who deserves the rights that I do. And there's other people in this country who think, no, 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 this is a country that's made just for a few folks. Folks like me, other people shouldn't have a say. And then maybe that's the deeper value than I want my party to win. The way I conceive of it is that I think there's a divide between liberals and conservatives as to what voting is for. Mm. So I think for liberals, for Democrats, but for generally for those on the left, voting is about dividing power among political equals. Yeah. Um, for those on the right, uh, I'm thinking of a column that Jonah Goldberg, the National Review and LA Times columnist yeah. wrote. He said, voting should be harder for everybody. Like, let's not make it so easy. You should have to show that you're committed and you can do it. So voting is about choosing the best answer. Mm. And so if you're going to do that, it's like, well, well, so who's qualified to make the best choice? Well, maybe we want people who own property or maybe we want people who can read English. Mm -hmm. You know, as recently as 1959, the United States Supreme Court said literacy tests, they're constitutional. They don't violate the Constitution. That ruling has never been overturned. Wow, really? The reason we don't have literacy tests is because it's in a federal statute, part of the Voting Rights Act. Wow, but it's constitutional still. It's still, at least formally, it's constitutional. So if this part of the Voting Rights Act were overturned or challenged as unconstitutional or repealed, we could have literacy tests, right? So so there's a long tradition in this country of the second tradition of voting being about yeah. choosing the best answer. Prove your prove your worth voting. Right. Prove that you're up to it. So that's not to me that's not quite as bad as we're putting this law in place because we want to win the election. Mm-hmm. It's you know, we have an honest belief that only those people with enough of a stake or enough knowledge should be able to vote. You end up in the same place and these yeah. things kind of, you know, uh, uh overlap with each other. But if we I, could I believe con- I believe that can be an honest belief. I don't believe that everybody who acts that way has that honest belief. Oh. I think that sometimes it is about excluding others. But I but I, I but I agree with you that there's a real difference of values there. But please, please complete your point. Well, so the, if we could actually convince people that these laws don't have huge partisan effects, that might lower the temperature a little bit. Mm. And also maybe maybe you won't have the Florida legislature seeking to disenfranchise these felons when they realize, you know, may, well, may not have this that I, it seems like there's a difference of opinion now that, you know, some of us believe that if, you know, whether or not you have been formerly incarcerated, you're still a full citizen who we is, is has dignity and respect in our eyes. And other people in Florida do not believe that. Absolutely. Right? And, and sure. that, I think we still might have a difference of opinion. On sure. That. But remember, as you mentioned earlier. A majority of Republicans, a majority of independents, a majority of Democrats. It had a 60% vote threshold voted for this amendment to reenfranchise yeah. felons. And around the country, there are a number of Republican states where felons have had their rights restored upon yes. completing their, which is great. I mean, I think that, that that's, a, that's a good thing. But, you know, so sure, there's a lot of disingenuous arguments, but I think there's also a philosophical debate. So w- when we're talking about that philosophical debate, between folks who believe that, you know, the franchise should be extended to everyone as a matter of human dignity and as a right. And people who say, oh, only the really best voters should be allowed. <laughs> the people we can trust to make a good decision. Do you think we can label one or other of those philosophies as more democratic than the other? Oh, yes. Okay. That, that is one of the arguments I make for why we need a constitutional yeah. amendment guaranteeing a right to vote. Ah. Which is that if you look at the, if you look at the kind of the, the current 
stated ethos of this country, it is political equality. It's the idea that you don't get to tell me, uh, you know, whether I get to vote. I don't get to tell you. We can each have our own opinions. We have a fair election, and the winner gets to yeah. uh, have their representatives in office. Uh, you can look at the one person, one vote rules, which the U.S. Supreme Court came up with in the 1960s. Uh, you know, if we didn't have that, you know, in California, it used to be that rural counties with a few thousand people had as much representation in the state legislature as Los Angeles County. Uh, you know, it was incredible. Yeah. And, the you know, the Constitution said nothing explicit about that. And until the the court in this very small period when the court was liberal in the 1960s, when Earl Warren, the former governor of California, was the United States president, that no, you have to have one person, one vote, equal voting power. Yeah. And this, I think, is an ethos. That, again, if you ask most people, I think they would agree with that. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but it seems that we have a persistent force in this country. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a group of people or, or a movement or, or what that is anti-democratic, despite our stated values and the, the overwhelming majority of Americans who support those democratic values, it seems that there's always been a strain in American politics of people who say, we don't like democracy, we don't want it, we want less people to be able to vote, we want to be able to call the shots. And there have been so many times in American history where we've allowed them to run the show despite our values. What, what is that force and, and where does that come from in this country? Yeah, so I, you know, I look at the Trumpist forces today, mm -hmm. you know, you, you look at Trump himself looking at strong leaders like Putin, you know, or Kim Jong-un, yeah. you know, dictators, like yeah. I want more power, you know, yeah. and like, oh, these guys are strong. Yeah, There's been this movement, you know, uh, there was a, uh, the other day there was a Trump supporter, uh, I can't remember his name, but you know, very, very popular on social media who was like, bring back Stalin. I mean, Stalin killed yeah. millions of people. It was a reign yeah. of terror. It was, Horrific, yeah. but there certainly is a renewed anti small d democratic strain in yeah. this country. And it's not just here, it's around the world. You know, part of it is that we're polarized. In the United States, government is somewhat paralyzed because of our polarization. Like, you can't get that much done when you have divided government. Yeah. Um, in other countries, you know, the governments fall because they don't have enough power to, to do what they want to do. And, 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 and we're trying to solve really big problems, right? Problems like climate change and immigration and you know, issues with the economy. And people are dissatisfied. And when they're dissatisfied, they think our democracy is not working. You know, so one answer to that is make our democracy better. You know, more power to the people. Yeah. Uh, an, another answer is I need a strong man. I need someone who's going to give me the answers, going to impose yeah. power from above. And so, so it's, it's a... Uh, it, it's not just a U.S. problem, but it's definitely a U.S. problem that you know, democracy, as I said, when we first started, it's not been a linear progression. It goes ups and downs. And we're now facing a very dangerous moment in our so, democracy. It's sort of part of the paradox of democracy, right? Because people talked about when Trump was elected that, you know, some folks just like fascists, like, you know, millions of people are born every day. Some of those people are who are born have the sort of personality trait or you know, maybe they were raised that way or whatever. By the time they're of voting age, they're just like, wow, I want like a big fucking asshole to tell me and everyone else what to do. Could we stop voting, please? I would like a big boss man in charge and let's all march with our flags and, you know, chant and stuff like that. Some people just that's what they get off on. That's what they enjoy. And when we live in a democratic society where everyone gets a vote, well, those anti-democratic people <laughs> can win and impose it on the rest of us. Right. So and that's sort of the part of the problem of a democracy to a certain extent, isn't it? And of course, it's exacerbated by the Electoral College, which gives of course. excessive power to smaller states yeah. and to swing states. And um, it's one of the two big institutions in this country that is not does not use equal voting power. The other one's the Senate. So, you know, Wyoming and Hawaii, relatively small populations, get the same representation as California and Texas, yeah. Florida, New York. So, you know, it's not a pure democracy. Um, but let me let me turn around and ask you, sure. suppose that 2024 is Trump versus Biden, mm -hmm. and let's say Trump hasn't been convicted of anything yet, mm -hmm. and Trump wins. Do you think there's going to be rioting in the street? And in, a, in what people think is a fair election. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, there's no proof of like messing with the vote totals or any yeah. of that stuff. Do you think people are rioting in the streets? 
I mean, I would expect uh, I would expect some marching and I would expect those to be, you know, very uh, vigorous. I, I can't say how, how far they would be between, uh, you know, the women's march and, uh, you know, the, the the George Floyd demonstrations. Right. I would say somewhere on that continuum yeah. in terms of uh, people expressing how they feel about that yeah. result. But I, I do think that people would accept the result as much as they may. Uh, some people might be, be dismayed about it. Well, so this is the question, because, you know, if you look at surveys of. Do you think the last election was fair? Yeah. Best predictor of how people answer that question? Did my guy win? Yeah. If my guy won, it was fair. Yeah. So. And I remember, it's very funny that I remember when, um, like, I believe it was George Bush beating John Kerry, you had uh, Democrats saying, oh, the voting machines, the voting right, machines. Right. They were so mad about the voting oh, machines. Yeah. And now those same people make fun of. Uh, Republicans for going after Dominion, and who know? I don't know how good the voting machines were that year, but y you saw those same strains. It always happens when you're side right, music. right, and because every election is seen as existential, and because the election system itself is so prone to people fighting about it, yeah, people are apt to believe that if their guy lost in a close election, somebody was doing something wrong. Yeah. Which means we have to have a really well-run election. We have to have transparency. We need to have the rules established in advance. There are all kinds of things we need to do, but it's hard to get everybody to do that when you have yeah. such a decentralized partisan system. And that's another way that America is less democratic than we say it is, because not only has the vote been taken away from so many people, so many people, but we have this very brittle system where we are prone to have an election where something goes wrong, people fight over the system and, you know, a court decides or there's some technicality or there's the national electoral vote split and half the country is like, I don't consider this election valid. And, you know, I, I always think about if you're if you're the, the chancellor of Germany, as it's a chancellor there, right? If you're the if you're the head of Germany, you're a prime minister of some other country in the world and you're looking at America, you're sort of like, man, that's a that's a fucked up democracy. Like, I don't know what's going to come out of there every four years. Like I could be sitting across the table from God knows who, because something like let's all cross our fingers that the system doesn't break this time. And that's, that doesn't really sound like a democracy. That sounds like, uh, you know, something on the verge of collapse. Well, it could be both a democracy and on the verge of collapse. <laughs> um, I spoke to a lot of nervous um, uh, dignitaries uh, before the 2020 election. And then yeah. after the election before, while it was being contested. Uh, who are very nervous because the United States has a outsized role in the world in yeah. preserving the peace and preserving democracy. And if the United States is teetering, then the whole world's in danger. So, you know, the question is, you know, how do you strengthen that? So uh, that requires finding people of good faith across the political spectrum yeah. and finding people in different areas. This is not just a legal problem or a political problem or a media problem or a tech problem. It's all of that. So I actually started something at UCLA called the Safeguarding Democracy Project. Mm. And that's what we do, bring people together. We're going to issue a report in the fall on how do we hold a fairer and safer election in 2024. We did it after 2020 uh, or as yeah. the 2020 election was coming. And some of our suggestions were taken up. Like, don't say Trump is in the lead when there's millions of ballots that are already cast but haven't been counted yet, yeah. say it's too early to call. So like messaging matters. Yes. That was something that the media and social media people from yes. our team were saying. So like you got to think about, because there's so many moving parts, how do we have a fair and safe election in 24? But the the problem though, if we, if you, I'm sure you're doing great work, right? <laughs> uh, studying what the the most democratic way to do these things are. And, I, and I've encountered folks studying that before. Actually, when I was in college, one of my very good friends, her senior thesis was, it was, uh, she was a mathematician and poli sci major. And she wrote a wonderful thesis that she told me about, about which voting system was the most democratic, you know, v w the way we do it. And what she found was that ranked choice voting was the most democratic, at least in 2004, when she was, uh, was working on this project. And I was like, wow, cool. Good to know that ranked choice voting is so awesome. How the fuck do we put it in place? Like a mathematician can't just go before Congress and be like, I did the math and this is the most democratic thing. Because as you point out, a lot of people don't actually want democracy. And there's a difference of philosophy about what democracy means. And when that's the case, like what, what does it even matter? The research that we do on, on what the, the most effective means of voting are 
if we if we don't even agree whether we want a democracy in this country? Sure. Two things. One, uh, these are very practical things. What can you do in the next two months? Like social media companies need to have this strategy, like yes. elevate the voices of those who are actually running elections, give them verified yes. status. So we're looking for actionable things that can help in, in all these different areas. So uh, not, you know, what should we do 20 years from now and have a national uh, body that's running elections? Not talking about that. It's like, mm. what can be done on the ground now? That's and great. we've got some practical suggestions. The other thing is ranked choice voting is a great example. 20 years ago, it was hardly used anywhere. Now they use it in a bunch of places, San Francisco, Oakland. Because we have such a decentralized system, mm -hmm. you can have experimentation. So I wrote an article in 1996 saying we should, you know, we should have public financing of elections, yeah. but we should do it with vouchers, right? So rather than giving like everyone who qualifies to be a candidate, you know, $20,000, give every voter $100 in vouchers and then they can give it to who they want. Mm -hmm. Seattle is doing that now. They're considering it in other places. So like... Because of local control, yeah. you can have some democratic experimentation. Now, I'm not saying ranked choice voting or vouchers are necessarily going to work. And there are people who are critics of these things. But there's at least it is one of the benefits of a decentralized system. There's a chance to try something else. Yeah. And there are states that are moving in a more democratic direction, like just again, talking about uh, Los Angeles, L.A. County elections, you know, uh, during the pandemic. The, you know, the wide expansion of mail-in voting, the new voting machines that they use that, all, that have a paper trail but are also electronic are fantastic. And as I was saying earlier, the fact that they synced up the calendar and made it so much more possible for people to vote in local elections, like there's been a huge flourishing of democracy like right where I live, and it's very inspiring. I'm like, okay, hopefully that'll, that'll trickle over to Florida one of these, one of these days. But I guess it still feels like we need to answer this question of how democratic we want the country to be and what democracy even means. And it strikes me, actually, that the whole time we've been talking and I've been asking you which system is more or less democratic, is this undemocratic or that is undemocratic? Well, what do you feel as someone who researches this, we even mean when we say that? Because if it's not in the Constitution, right, if according to our Constitution, we're not even that democratic, what is our benchmark for what democracy even means? Right. Um, so first, I should say that some of the things you pointed to as um, victories mm. are controversial. Oh, OK. If you move local elections to um, correspond with presidential elections. How do you get any oxygen when everyone's paying attention True. to Biden versus Trump? How do you get someone to vote for the 14th congressional uh, for the 14th uh, uh, city council seat? Well, I'll say that I'll say that my experience was that syncing up caused a huge number of more people to be involved in the local election because they were so worked up about the national election, which they felt they had no control over. But they're like, oh, God, I'm so worried about the election. You could say, well, guess what? There's a local candidate who you can go knock doors for or, or you can raise money for. And they would say, oh, my God, I can help. OK, great. And, and it, it was sort of drafted off of the energy of the. Now, that was just one year. That was in 2020. It was a very strange year for many reasons. But I did have that experience of, of seeing the energy transfer. And, and the voting machines that yeah. um, they're called BMDs, ballot marking devices, mm -hmm. ATM screen, yeah. ballot comes out, has a little QR code that gets read by the computer. Yes. There are some computer scientists who think that this is a terrible system and, that, oh. and, that, and there's actually a lawsuit in Georgia where Georgia has these um, machines uh -huh. and they're fighting over whether or not these machines uh, create problems in terms of potential uh, hacking. So, okay. well, I like that it keeps a paper ballot. That's what yeah, I like. Yeah, oh, it, paper is absolutely essential. Yes. But the question is whether the, you know, if you're going to count not the votes that are written, printed on there, but the code, yeah. whether that creates a problem. On your broader question of democracy, I think the answer is that this is for us to define ourselves, right? Mm. So we defined what our, who was part of the democratic polity in a different way in the 1780s than we do today. Yeah. I think today that conception of voting as distribution of power among political equals is the dominant one that should be adopted and that um, we can have certain basic requirements, residency. So you shouldn't be able to vote for the North Carolina governor and someone from Texas shouldn't be able to vote for our city council. So residency makes sense. Citizenship is, I think, a good dividing line, at least for national elections. 
adulthood, you know, California is talking about lowering the voting age to 16. Why? You get more Democrats that way. You know, so mm. uh, there, there are, you know, <laughs> there are places that want to, uh, there was somebody who wanted to raise the voting age to 25, one of the presidential candidates. Um, so, yes, uh, this looks like picking your voters to do that. Right. But I think it's picking your voters when you lower it to 16 as well as when you raise it to 25. Well, I mean, I, there I, is I no I neutral. I remember being 17 and being like, this shit affects me. You sure, know? sure. Um, but so the, my point and, is. And people also, by the way, who are immigrants also live in the country and the policies sure, affect them as right. well. And so this is exactly my point, is that this is part of a democratic dialogue. Yeah. That there is no single answer to who counts as this community. And a lot of it requires a political struggle, right? So in 1877, the courts didn't say women get the right to vote. It took that agitating for the next 50 years and a constitutional amendment. So if we have a certain conception of democracy, we have to fight for it. Yeah. But do you feel that we are having that conversation? Do you feel that we're moving in the wrong direction? I don't think we're having this conversation enough. Yeah. And I think there's a lot more heat than light. Mm. So, you know, Georgia passed this voting law that Democrats said was going to be the end of the world. And it turned out to have relatively minor effects. There are parts of it that I think are quite bad. There are parts of it that are just fine. But you remember there was the Major League Baseball move, the All-Star game. Yeah. So now Republicans have gone. Uh, they, they just last week held a, a uh, press conference in um, Georgia and said, we're going to try and do nationally what they did in Georgia. And so like... Rather than think about how do we rationally design a system so that all eligible voters, but only eligible voters, can easily cast a vote that can be meaningfully and fairly counted? Yeah, I can say in one sentence what we should have. Um, it's it's all it's the it's these fights about, yeah. and so elections have become the same kind of political issue as everything else, and it's become an issue where facts matter a lot less than yeah you would want. But is there a way in a world where you know, the, the elections are controlled by politicians and politicians have an incentive to pick their voters and to, to uh, adjust the system to benefit them. Is there a way to come up with a system that, that everybody thinks is fair? I mean, I do think often about, someone told me once the most effective way to uh, cut up a cake is to let one person slice the cake and the other person choose which slice. Sure. Because if you're the person slicing but not choosing, you're like, well, I gotta make it fair. Otherwise, they're just gonna pick the big one. Um, that's easy for cake. <laughs> Is it, is it? It seems like a lot harder for elections. It is. And it, there are 24 states that have some version of direct democracy, mm. um, like the felon reenfranchisement in Florida that we talked about. Yeah. Like California adopting registering commissions. Right. So there are things that can be done through the people to get around the self-interest of politicians. Yeah. Um, but I think it's going to take a political movement. You know, it might mean people out in the streets. Yeah. Protesting for democracy. I mean, that's how we got the Voting Rights Act. It wasn't as though Politicians were sitting around one day saying, you know what? It's really not fair what's going on in the South. Let's do something about it. It took popular pressure. Yeah. And what you have in some states, for instance, uh, states that have uh, ended gerrymandering, um, and some of them, that was the result of political movements coming together, lobbying, getting a, you know, a, a, a proposal passed, you know, a, a direct democracy uh, amendment passed to end it. And then those uh, organizations stick around to continue advocating and making sure that we don't backslide. Um, and, and so that movement seems to be vitally important. Is there a way that people can join this movement, do you think? Sure. So uh, a good example is Michigan. Mm -hmm. This is what I was thinking of. Yeah, Michigan, you had, uh, uh, and there's a documentary called Slay the Dragon mm -hmm. about uh, uh, the popular organization that formed to pass an amendment to the Michigan Constitution that took away the power of politicians to draw their own district. And, and I, this, was, this was called Voters Not Politicians was the organization, yeah. right? Yeah. I remember them because I donated 50 bucks or whatever yeah. that year. Yeah, and, and since then, uh, there have been more voter initiatives yeah. put on the ballot, especially after what happened in 2020 with Trump trying to yeah. mess with the election rules. Um, so this can be replicated in lots of places. There are other states, there are different strategies. So in some states, there's been litigation to go to the state Supreme Court. It's like, okay, the U.S. Constitution doesn't control partisan gerrymandering, but what about the state Constitution? And so there have been a number of states, North Carolina, New York, uh, others that have said the state Constitution contains, so, uh, contains a, an anti-gerrymandering prohibition. So there are lots of paths to try and do this. But I think ultimately, what we need is 
to impose a national floor. Mm. And the way to do that is by passing a constitutional amendment that says what I said before. If you're, you know, an adult resident citizen, uh, non felon, or someone who's completed their sentence, you should have the right to cast a ballot and have your ballot fairly counted. And then I have a bunch of subsidiary rules to make sure that it actually works. Uh, but you can't let the courts mess it up. We can't let the states mess it up. So even if we don't move to a national system, even if we stay decentralized, we need to impose a floor. Yeah. It shouldn't be that we had before a recent election in North Dakota that, that tribal uh, officials had to work around the clock to print uh, IDs with newly created residential addresses so that people wouldn't be disenfranchised. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's just... It's, it's, these laws are not preventing any appreciable amount of fraud. Yeah. They're being put in place for bad reasons or at best for misguided reasons. And so we have to see the right, you know, you said the right to vote is fundamental. You said that, I agree with you. Where'd you get that? You didn't get it from our constitution. I got it in school. You know, it was, it was how I was brought up was to believe that. Yeah. And, and, and frankly, I got it from watching like the commercials during football games. Yeah. It's just part of Schoolhouse Amer Rock. American culture, right? American culture, but not American law. And, uh, but, but you know, I think our hope is that uh, and this is, you know, what, what the, what the politicians will, politicians will say in their most soaring speeches that, you know, when they say America's reality lives up to its ideals, that's what they're talking about. And you do seem like an optimistic guy. You seem to feel that if we actually have this conversation, put some of these rules in place, we can live up to those ideals. Well, I, I'm, I'm a little bit heartened by 2022 mm. because 2020 was a very scary moment. And yeah. I think people woke up and they recognized that. And so we're fighting now against election subversion, which we haven't talked about, like trying to turn an election loser into an election winner. Sure. Um, but I think that movement towards democracy is continuing to build. Yeah. And I think young people don't want to, put up with what their elders have yeah. given them to inherit. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of energy. Yeah. I see it among my students and I, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't want to say I'm optimistic. What I would say is that uh, I'm hopeful yeah. and I think it's a, a, you know, more of a call for activism than a, than a call for resignation. I think at the end of the day, you can't fight the culture. And when the culture of the people demands democracy, that is at the end of the day what what we will be able to get because people can people can tell when it's being taken away and they call bullshit on it. But it's going to require a lot of work. And yeah. so that's that that there's no shortcut. Demo isn't that the phrase democracy requires constant vigilance? Is that the phrase? Uh, Something uh, like that? Could be. Could be. I don't know. Maybe I combine two phrases. Rick, thank you so much for being here. If people want to get a copy of your book, you can do so at factuallypod.com slash books. Is there anywhere else that you would like to direct them? Where can they find you on your own social media? Sure. You can find me uh, at the election law blog. Mm. Um, that's real wonky stuff. Uh, this is, that sounds like my kind of blog. Uh, or you can go to safeguardingdemocracyproject.org and see the work we're doing to try to assure we have free and fair elections in 2024. Rick, thank you so much for being here. It's been incredible. Great to talk to you. Well, thank you once again to Rick Hassan for coming on the show. If you want to pick up a copy of his book, head once again to factuallypod.com slash books. And if you want to support this show directly, head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Just five bucks a month gets you every episode of this show ad-free and a bunch of other goodies as well. For 15 bucks a month, I will read your name on this very podcast. Our most recent $15 a month subscribers are Kim Kepler, Trey Burt, Patrick Ryan, my own Avenger, and Matt Clausen. I thank all of you so much for helping keep this podcast free for everyone who wants to listen to it. I want to thank our producers, Sam Roudman and Tony Wilson, our wonderful engineer, Rochelle, everyone here at HeadGum for helping make this show possible. If you want to see my tour dates, you can find them at adamconover.net. You can find me on social media at Adam Conover, wherever you get your social media. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next time on Factually. That was a HeadGum podcast. <laughs>